today's session was meant for probabilities. And let me know if you can see my presentation. So I've, um, since we are left with very few sessions, oh no, you, you don't have a lot of time for me to carry on and do more sessions because you are writing on the 10th of September. So I decided to combine the probabilities. So we'll do the probability and the normal distribution, which is the z-score together. together. Um, and then I also just want to extend it in terms of how you use your Z test statistic, which is the Z score. We, um, I'm just going to show you how to read your tables um, for when you're looking for the probability, especially when you do the hypothesis testing and you're looking for the probability of greater than for a one tail test or a directional test and so for a a two-tailed test or which we call it a non-directional test. So I just wanted to show you that process as well. So without wasting any further time, um, do you have any question before we start with the session? Anyone with a question or comment? No, none. All right. Okay, then we can start looking at basic probabilities. So if by the end of the session, you should be able to explain your basic probability concepts. You should be able to know how to calculate your probabilities looking at the basic rules of probabilities, which are your multiplication rules, your mutually exclusive event or rule, your multiplication rule and your independence. Um, and when we deal with the independence, we're going to look at conditional probabilities, probability calculating a probability given that something else has happened. And then later on, we'll look at how we calculate the set scores. Okay. So in, in order for you to know the probabilities, you need to understand the concepts around them. Probability section in your module probably is the easiest one because you normally use your probabilities on a day-to-day -day basis. But in a nutshell, when we talk about the probability, we're talking about a study of chances. Here we look at a chance that a certain event will happen and that when we calculate the probabilities, they should always be between zero and one. When you calculate and you find that the answer you get is 1,6 something, you must know that that is not the probability. There's something wrong that you did when you would calculate. Or when you are calculating the probabilities and you get minus 1,4, must know that that is not a probability. Probability value should always be between 0 and 1. And when a probability has a value of 1, we say that when we calculate in that probability, the event that occurred there was certain. So it means that event was said to have or to always have to happen or it has to always okay. Like for example, we always know that the sun will come out. So the probability of the sun coming out will always be equals to one. And also the probability of the sun going down, it will always be equals to one. We also have an instance where that probability of an event will be equals to zero. Therefore, it means that event has no chance of happening. Um, mm, 
now I'm lost. I don't know which example I can give you in terms of where an event will have a probability of a zero. Oh, um, you will have a probability of a zero. Let's say, for example, uh, the probability of living on the planet Sun. That probability is a zero. Nobody can live there. You will bend. So we know that that probability will the event of living of of that person living on a sun will be equals to zero. And that is the probability of an impossible event. That is an event that can never happen. So when we assess the probabilities, um, there are several approaches that we can do. We can use what we call a priori, which means um, the likelihood of an event happening will always have a finite number because then that event will happen and we also know about it that it from experience or from the past that that event will happen. And that is your priority. And to calculate the probability of that event happening, we use the number of event or the number of outcomes from that event divided by the total divide by all of the events that could happen. We can also assess them by using the empirical method, which also looks at the likelihood of an event occurring based on historical data. So this one, usually we use this um, when we calculate the probability like for example how will i know that the probability of a sun coming out and will always come out will be equals to one is because history told us that the sun comes out every day so i know about that and that is empirical probability also they say we calculate that probability by taking the outcome satisfying that event divided by the total outcome so by all some of all the events together. For example, also for priori, let's say for example, a priori we can use a coin. If I toss a coin, I know that a coin can land on a head or a tail. So when I toss a coin, my number of event that a, a, a coin will land on a head, it's one. But the total outcome is because they a coin has two sides to it, it has the head and the tail. So there are the total will be equals to two. So it will be one divided by two. Then the last one, the last approach that we can use is what we call a subjective method. And this is when the researcher uh, uses their own objectivity or subjectivity when it comes to calculating that probability. So it uses, um, it's based on a combination of individuals past experience. So there are some biases that will occur when you do the subjective probability. So individual past experience, personal opinion and analysis of a particular phenomena or a situation. And that will be a subjective and the probability that you will calculate there will always be a biased one because if you bring in your own feeling as a researcher into the research, you're going to bring in your own biases into it. Okay, so let's, I've been talking about outcomes and events. Now let's define what those things are that I've been talking about. So, when an event happened, like tossing a coin, I can call that process an event. When an event happened, it produces some outcome. And an outcome of an event can either be a head or a tail if it's a coin. So when I toss a coin, I'm creating an event. And the outcome that can happen from me tossing that coin will be either the coin will land on a head or a tail. Those are your outcomes. So we use events to calculate the probabilities because we look at the outcomes and we sum all those outcomes and use them to calculate 
our probability. So a simple event is when you do one thing at a time. A simple event will be tossing a coin. I'm doing one coin, tossing it. That's a simple event. And with the simple event, it also have what we call a sample space. And I will describe what the sample space is. But in a nutshell, a sample space is the total of all the outcomes that can happen from that event. We call those sample space. So when I create an event, which is a simple event of tossing a coin, and that event can land either on a head or a tail. So if I say I want an event when I toss a coin and it lands on a head, I'm going to assume that that event is my simple event because it's only one variable that I am looking at or one characteristic that I'm looking at. And also I have what we call a joint event. So a joint event is when you do two things or two things happening at the same time. That we call it a joint event. A joint event of um, going to school Uh, oh, let me put it this way. A joint event will be when I have two or more characteristics. So it means from event, let's say um, my event is rainy days. So uh, it's uh, I can either record whether it, it, today is it rainy, yes, tomorrow it's not rainy, no. So I have an out, uh, two outcomes for the rainy, yes and no days. So yes for rain, no for no day, no rain on that day. Then I can also have, if I work uh, as an HR practitioner, I can check um, the uh, absenteeism of employees at the at the workplace. So I can check. So my uh, my event will be absenteeism, and I can check my outcome can either be Yes, they were absent. No, they were not absent. So there are two events that I'm talking about. I'm talking about a rainy day and absenteeism. So both of them, they can happen at the same time because someone can be absent because it's rainy and they are absent because they, it is rainy. So those two are joint events happening at the same time and that is your joint event. Then we also have what we call a complement event. So if I have, I'm going to go back to the scenario of using a coin. If I have a coin and it has a head, when I'm looking at the probability of a head or an event head, the complement of an event of a head will be the other one that is not in a head, which will be a tail. So when we talk about probabilities, we always also have what we call a complement event. A complement event is another event that is not part of the original one, but they all form part of a sample space. Remember, all probabilities should be between zero and one, and later on I will tell you that the sum of all probabilities should be equal to one. So therefore it means if I add the probability of a head and a probability of a tail, I should get one because one divided by two is 0 0.5 and one divided by two will be 0 0.5 and 0 0.5 plus 0 0.5, they equals to one. So a complement event will be the event that is not part of the original event or not part of the first event that you were looking for, but both of them needs to be part of the sample space. Then we also have what we call mutual events. So we also spoke about joint events. I said absenteeism and rainy days. Those are two events. When we talk about mutual exclusive events, we're talking about um, events that cannot happen at the same time. So 
those two events cannot happen at the same time. And later on, we'll learn uh, what the probability of that is. So for example, uh, I'm now I'm going to go back to my slides. Uh, for example, if I have a calendar for 2014 and I choose a day that is in January and I also choose a day that is in February. So a day in January becomes my A and a day in February becomes my uh, B. So a day in January and a day in February cannot happen at the same time because one happens in January and the other one happens in February. And that is what we call mutually exclusive events. Then we also get um, what we call collectively exhaustive events. And a collective exhaustive event are all events that make up your sample space. So, also, if I have a day, a calendar of 2014, let's assume that I have it A as my weekday and B as my weekend, C as my January day and D as spring. All of them can happen in my calendar because it, um, a weekend will be in 2014 and a weekday also exists in 2014. January is also another month in 2014 and D will be spring in uh, 2014. They all can happen. So all of them are co together, are collectively exhaustive. But now, if you look at A and B, alone if i take a day on a week a weekday and a day on a weekend only a and b are also collectively exhaustive for the days in 2014 because all all days in 2014 either falls on a weekday or falls on a weekend and A day on a weekday and a day on a weekend are mutually exclusive because they cannot happen at the same day at the same time. And A, B, and D are not mutually exclusive and also A, B and C are not mutually exclusive because a day on a weekday and a day on a weekend can also be in January and they can also be in spring. So they are not mutually exclusive. But A and B are mutually exclusive and they are also collectively exhaustive because they all form part of 2014 calendar. A sample space, like I've been talking about the sample space, is a collection of all events, all of them. So for example, if I roll a die, it has six sides to it. So all six sides are part of my event. They form part of my sample space. A deck of cards has 52 cards in there. 52 cards are my sample space because an event will be me drawing a king of heart or ace of diamond or drawing a ten of dice. That will be an event that I will draw from 52 cards. So and we can use the event and the outcomes, sample space, which will be our total to create probabilities. But before we do the probabilities, I want you also to understand that you can also visualize the probabilities and we can use different methods to visualize probabilities. So when you answer the probability questions, try and use one of the methods because one of them might assist in 
I'm visualizing your problem that you have, and you might get the answer easier that way. So you can use what we call a Venn diagram, which is the diagram that we have been using um, where I was doing the illustration of joint events, simple event, complement event. What do I mean by that? So you can use a Venn diagram. Oh, sorry. So where your Venn diagram, your outside will be your sample space. Inside your sample space, you can either have an event, one event, which will be a day happening on a Wednesday and have another day happening in January. And we can see that they intersect at some point. So they do combine because a day January will also be there and a day. I'm not drawing it right, but you can see. So the blue area is where they both intersect. And that is our joint event because Wednesday is your simple event. January is a simple event and where they both meet is what we call a joint event. And we can calculate the probability of this joint event because if I want to find the probability of a day being on a Wednesday or in January. So if I want to find the probability of a day in Wednesday or in that falls on January, that will be given by the probability of a day on a Wednesday plus the probability of a day in January minus because I don't have to recount double count those ones because they those values they will be in January and they are also in on Wednesday so it means I must take away one of them so that will be the probability of Wednesday and January which is the joint probability I should be able to calculate that. But if a day does not fall on in, in January, so this is for the normal one. So for mutually exclusive events, let's say we want to calculate, let's say this is our sample space. We have a weekday, let's use weekday and weekends. Week, weekday and week, can't. I'm I'm separating them with an ND and NK weekday and weekend. So this is our sample space. So if this is the scenario, then we have a day on a week weekday and a day on a Wednesday. They do not meet anywhere. Therefore, that probability will be the probability of a day on a week weekday or the probability of a day on a weekend weekend will be given by the probability of a day on a week day plus the probability of a day on a weekend because then that does not exist because the probability of a joint probability of a week day and and a weekend sorry and a weekend that will be equals to zero because it does not exist so then that will be your probability of a weekend or a week okay later on we will do this in more detail don't worry about it now then we can also visualize it by using a decision tree and with a decision tree for example if i toss a coin it's either going to land on a head or a tail so let's say for example let's keep one let's say i toss and the first time i toss it it lands on a head. The second time I toss it, it can either land on a head or a tail. And let's say it landed on a head, we record that. If it landed on a tail, we record that. 
at the end, after we have collected all the information we want, we can calculate how many outcomes do we have. So, for example, now in terms of this one, it's head and a head. Therefore, the outcome will be a head and a head. And this will be a head and a tail, a tail and a head, and a tail and a tail. And in a nutshell, there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight outcomes. When you toss two coins, we can also visualize it, which is one of the tables that I like to use, which is a contingency table, because then on my contingency table, later on I will show you, you can calculate your simple event, which means the probability of men can be calculated from there. So this will be your simple event, a simple event women, and a simple event promoted, and a simple event not promoted. And that is your sample space. Joint event of promoted and named, you can find it on there. And so, and so on and so forth. So I, li I like to use the contingency table because it's easier to represent the probability. And also, it's easy to represent your probability using a Venn diagram as well. Okay, now let's learn how to calculate these probabilities. So. To calculate a simple probability, we use a simple event because there is only one of them. So let's say if I want to calculate the probability of a simple event, I use an outcome satisfying that event divided by the sample space, which is my grand total, which is my n, how many they are. So let's look at an example. Like I said, I like using a contingency table. You will see that I use it more often. So if I have, I work at this HR department and I have the number of men and women who were employed at this company and I have a record of how many were promoted this year and how many were not promoted. And I, I know that in this company, there are 1,200 employees. So if I want to calculate the probability of being promoted. Regardless of whether I'm in, uh, in this company, I want to know whether it's a male or female, it doesn't matter. All I want is to know how many employees in this company were promoted. And there are 324 employees that were promoted, but mm -hmm. I need to know the probability. Outcome satisfying the event divided by the grand total. The event is promoted, which is 324, divided by the grand total or our sample space, which is 1,200. Which then gives us 0, 0,27 number of employees that were promoted in this company. That is simple event. Stop me if you're not understanding anything that I'm talking about so that then I don't just go, 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 go. We will have some exercises later on as well. Joint probabilities. A joint probability refer to probability of an occurrence of two or more events. Remember that it comes from when we have two events happening at the same time. So in order for us to calculate the joint probability, we can use the same because if the outcome satisfying the event of a joint probability, regardless of whether um, the other thing doesn't happen or not, we know that there is a joint event. There are two events that happen. So we just use those outcome of those two events divide by the grand total or the sample space. If I need to calculate the probability of men being promoted using the same data that I had previously. So now it means I must go and find this joint probability for this joint event. So to calculate the joint probability there, I'm going to take the event satisfying the uh, the joint event is 
there are 288. I need to divide it by the grand total. So, which are, there are 1,200 members. In a nutshell, if I use a contingency table, I should be able to calculate my simple event and my joint event, where inside the table, inside my contingency table, I should be able to calculate my joint probabilities because those are my joint events. And I should be able to calculate my simple probabilities because my simple probabilities are calculated from the totals. And in a nutshell, up to now, so far, what you have learned are the following. You have learned that a probability is the likelihood of an event happening, and it is also calculated as a numerical measure, and it is between zero and one. Remember that the, your probabilities are between zero and one, and if it has a probability of one, we say that is a certain event, if it has a probability of a zero, we say it's an impossible event. And if it's a 50-50 chance, we say it's a moderate or a 50-50 probability. It's a 50-50 chance. What we also learned is all probabilities are between zero and one, but we also learned that the sum of all probabilities should always be equals to one. So if I add all events, uh, all probability, all probabilities of the events happening, I should get to one. Also have learned that a complement event is an event or it is an event that is not part of the original event, but they all form part of the sample space. So it means since we say the sum of all probabilities should be equals to one, therefore it means if I take the probability of A plus the probability of a complement, then a complement we always use a subscript so that it becomes or it shows as a complement. If I take the probability of a complement this side, then it will be probability of A plus the probability of a complement will be equals to one, which is what we just said. The sum of all probabilities should be equals to one. So if you have a probability of an A and they ask you to find the probability of a complement, then you just say one minus the probability of an A, it will give you the probability of a complement. What we also I need to remember as well is the probability of a joint event A and B will be equals to zero. And it only happens if A and B are mutually exclusive. If they are mutually exclusive, then the probability of a joint event will be equals to zero. And that is probabilities thus far. So now let's look at how we use the rules. We already introduced some of the rules, but in terms of the addition rule, which is one of the rules that we already introduced, is we say the probability of an event A or B happening, it's given by the probability of event A plus the probability of event B minus the probability of event A and B happening at the same time. And that is for a normal circumstance. If A and B are mutually exclusive, because we know that when they are mutually exclusive, the probability of a joint event A and B will be equals to zero, then the addition rule states that the probability of A or B will be equals to probability of A plus the probability of B. Then, 
sometimes you will have what we call the conditional probability. That is the probability of an event happening given that another event has already happened. And that probability is the probability of A given that the probability of B has already happened. And that is the probability of A and B, which is the joint probability of those three events, divided by the probability of the given. And we can also rewrite this if we do B given A, we can write it as the joint probability of A and B divided by the given, which is the probability of an A. If and only if events are independent, if and only if events are independent. So event A and B, if they are independent, it means A has no bearing on what happens to B or B has no influence on A or A has no influence on B. If that is the case, if the two events are independent, then our conditional probability, if we're looking for the probability of a joint event because we know don't get confused with the formula as you see it because our joint probability remember it was a given b is equals to the probability of a and the uh, is equals to the probability of a and b a and b divided by the probability of b you remember that all what we're doing is multiplying the probability of A and B by B and making A and B the subject of the formula. So what we're saying is with multiplication rule for independence, we're going to state that if we're looking for the joint probability of A and B, and we know that the probability of A and B are independent, when event A and B are independent. Therefore, the conditional probability, remember now we're talking about that, the conditional probability will state that since B has no influence on A, so therefore it means the probability of A given B will be the same as the probability of A because B has no influence on A. Then, the multiplication rule will be the probability of A and B will be equal to the probability of A multiplied by the probability of B. Only for if they're asking you to find the probability of the joint event, A and B, then you do the multiplication rule. Pay attention. The first one we did where we were talking about addition rule, Addition rule states that the probability of A or B, either A or B are happening. Here we say A and B are happening. So both of them are happening. The, the addition rule says either one of them is happening. So that will be different because for A or B, we know that it will be the probability of A plus the probability of B minus the probability of A and B. Or it will be if they are mutually exclusive, then therefore it will be the probability of A plus the probability of B for mutually exclusive. So two things, multiplication rule, we know that if A and B are independent, how will I know? If they say there are 11 boys in the class and eight girls in a class, and they are asking you, what will be the probability that we select one boy and one girl? The key with the are those two. What is the probability of selecting a girl, one girl, and one boy? Therefore, we're looking for the multiplication rule. What is the probability of selecting one girl and one boy? 
multiplication rule. What is the probability of selecting one boy or one girl? Then we're talking about addition rule. You need to pay attention to the question. Okay, so later on when we do the exercises from your from your past exam papers, then you will learn how to do the um, differentiate between the two. Which one do we use? Multiplication rule or addition rule? And with that, uh, this is just an additional one for the independence. We already covered the first one. So if it's probability of B given A, we know that B, um, sorry, A has no bearing on what happens to B. So therefore, the probability of B given A will just be the probability of B. Because if A and B are independent, then one event does not affect the other event. In closing and in summary, independent events happens when an event has no effect on the other event. Mutually exclusive events occurs when one event precludes the occurrence of the other, so they cannot happen at the same time. Exhaustive events or collectively exhaustive events are events that has all sets of possible uh, uh, a set of events representing all possible outcomes so it means they should be part of your sample space then we also have what we call a law of disjuncture which is your editic uh, addictive law uh addition law i'm just gonna call it that way it's uh the law when uh, events are mutually exclusive and we also have a law of conjunction which is a multiplicative law which is the law regarding independence so remember the two so this first one is the probability of a or b and this one is the probability of a and b okay so let's look at the exercise. In a population, there are 450 people whom 150 smoke. What is the probability of randomly selecting a non-smoker? So now here they say we have smokers and uh, and we know what our sample space is. So this is our sample space. And this is our X in this instance. So you can do this two ways. Remember, smokes and smokers, two sides. Like a head and a tail, take it like that. So you, you have two. So you have smoker, a smoker, and you have a non-smoker. So if they all are equal, so we have a total there. If I know that there are 150 smokers and they told us there are 450 of the people in this population. So how many smokers are there? 150, how many non-smokers will be there? That is the complement of, so if this is A, this will be the complement. So what they're asking you is calculate the complement of smoker. But because we're looking for the probability, so we need to know how many smokers are there. We can just say there are 450 minus 150. There are 300. So therefore, in order to calculate the probability of none smoker i'm a lazy writer so i'll just abbreviate and smoker is non-smoker there are 300 remember it, the probability of a is your outcome satisfying the event divided by how many there are so the outcome satisfying which is my x in this instance now will be 300 divided by how many there are which is my total of 450 and that is how much? 0 
Are there no other numbers? Zero point six 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 recurring yes. then seven at the end. Yeah, so you must pay attention because there you have two decimals and they say you must have only two decimals, so they are recurring. So if I keep those two, this is six to be zero point six seven to add one to this value and that answer will be zero comma six seven. Yes. And that is option number one. Sorry, Mr. We just take it up until the third decimal. So six, 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 and it, do we stop at the third decimal to make it? Yes. Okay. Okay. Um, the law of rounding off says they uh, look at the last digit after the value that you want to round off to and decide whether if that value to the right, if the value to the right, if I'm leaving two decimal, I must look to the right, the value to the right, if it's greater than or equals to five, I must then add one to the value I'm stopping at or I'm rounding off to. I know that it's complex, but that's, that's how it is. So you just look to the next door number and you add one if it's more than five. Five or equals to five. More than five or equals to five. Okay. Which one of the following does not represent a probability? Number one, two, or three. So in this instance, if we were talking, we said there are between zero and one. And because there are decimals, because this will be decimals, so if I multiply the probability by 100, then I'm turning it into a percentage. So this will be, so if I had my, remember my probability line, and if here at the middle it's 0 0.5, so this will be 0%, this will be 50%, and this will be 100%. So now, which of the following does not represent the probability? I would say two. Zero. Mm. Mm. No, three. no, no. I think it's three. It's three. Because three, three has a negative, the probability. I, I thought when I'm writing this, I'm giving you. <laughs> so remember that the probabilities are between one, uh, zero, zero and, and one. one. So, and if it's, it, it, there is a probability of zero because for mutually exclusive event, the probability of A and B not happening is equal to zero because it does not exist. It's there. So anything outside of that, will not be a probability if if yeah they would have said uh 10 uh, no 10 percent will still be no let's not say 10 percent if they would have said 10 and this was 0 0.5 without that dot in the minus number two will be correct because it's also outside of one it's bigger than one so it will be number two so you must just pay attention probabilities are between zero and one and we can represent them as percentages as well because they can be proportions. And when they are in a percentage form, they will be 0% to 100%. Yes. Thank you. If 10,000 students were, uh, if 10,000 students wrote exam admission test, 7,000 passed, and they obtain a 50% or more, and 400 obtain 50, exactly 50%, what is the probability that a randomly selected student will fail? So now, the same thing. We know that student pass or they fail. Now, the tricky part with this question is, because they talk about pass, and obtain a 50% or more, and then they say pass with 50. 
And they also say you want you need to calculate those who have failed. I know someone on WhatsApp did ask this question. Um, and I tried to explain it in a quicker way. So, but now, what you can also do is we know that the total, all of them who have passed or failed regardless, they are 10,000 of them in this. So we also know that 70 of them passed. So we can put 7,000, 7,000 of them have passed. Because this is where the tricky part on this one is. It says how many of them have failed. It be the same as the one that we just did. So this 400 are included in the 7,000 in the 7,000 because here it says they obtain 50% or more. So it means those who from this 7,000, if I split them, so I can find out who got exactly 50% and who got more than 50% because I can take the 400 for the for the 50% exactly, and the balance of 6,600 will be those who passed with more than uh, 50%. Both of them will be 7,000. So now, regardless of this confusing one, we just use the 7,000. We calculate how many have failed. How many have failed will be the 10,000 minus the 7,000. 3,000. Which will be equals to 3,000. Therefore, to calculate the probability of fail, we say 3,000 divided by 10,000. And... 0 0.3 and that will be sorry a probability of an event occurring which depend on something else occurring such as passing a test when you do not understand your course can be described as a probability of something else occurring depending on something else happening can be described um, as number, number one, one, which is conditional probability. Remember mutually exclusive events, independent events, events have no bearing on the other. Mutually exclusive events, they cannot happen at the same time. Multiplicative events, same as independent, if we want the probability of the joint probability, but for independent events, then that will be our multiplicative probability that we can calculate. Ah, this was not supposed to be there. Okay, I will we will come back to this when we do the normal probability questions. If 10,000 students wrote a university admission test, 7,000 7, passed, and 3,000 obtain a 50%. Oh, this is exactly the same as the one that we just did. Uh, I'm not going to ask you to calculate it, or do you want to calculate it on your own? Let's see. What is the probability that the randomly selected student will fail a test? Number three. It's still number three because we're just going to take the 10,000, subtract the 7,000 
to get the fail. And that will be 3000 of them. And we just calculate the probability of a fail which is 3,000, the event satisfying a fail, divided by the grand total or the sample space, which is 10,000, which is 0, 0,3. Still the same. What I've noticed as well with your past exam papers are, almost your questions are the same, year after year after year. The only thing that they change is, the values like you remember on the other one it was 400 on this one they put 300. i like your teachers i like them very much they don't like to complicate them their lives and your life yeah. okay so we done with basic probabilities now let's look at normal distribution uh, it's also going to go as quick as possible um, because then we're not doing any exercises. We'll only do the exercise late at the end of the session. So, a normal distribution is what we call a belly shaped curve. And the distribution is symmetrical because the mean, the median, and the mode are the same. So they all equals to zero. And we also say normal distribution is distributed with the mean of zero and the standard deviation of one. Even though I'm saying it's distributed with the mean of zero and the standard deviation of one, it does not mean all normal distribution will have a standard deviation of one because you will not you will see later on at the next um, when I do the next slide. So this is for a standard normal distribution. We say it has a standard deviation of one because we say the distance between the mean area and the outside of the curve should always be one standard deviation away. So, or the value should be one standard deviation away from the mean. But it doesn't stop the curve. It can still be a normal distribution curve if it's like that. Where the mean and the median are the same, it's symmetrical, but the the distance between the mean and this, the outside area of the curve will not be one standard deviation. It can be half standard deviation. It will be, uh, if, it's, if it's flatter than this, let's use the same and let's draw another one there. So you can see that there's distance there and they are different. So it's, the distance there is, bigger than the distance there, it's bigger than this one day, it's smaller than that one day, things like that. Also, what you need to know about normal distribution is the area, this whole area underneath the curve, this hair underneath this belly shape, we call it the probability. It is always equals to one. So the sum of all this area underneath the curve is equals to one. Therefore, if I split this normal distribution curve in half, where the mean is, this area there will be 50% or 0 0.5, and this area will be 50%. So the probability, and then which is the area underneath the curve, so the area underneath the curve, which we also call the probability, probability is equals to one. So half of it will be 50% this side, 50% that side. That is why when we do hypothesis testing, you remember when you do hypothesis testing for the mean and you need to find the P value, which is the area underneath the curve and we use the value of our Z standardized 
score to go find the probability. And that's what I'm going to show you right now. So we will be finding these areas, these probabilities underneath the curve. So we also say when we look at normal distribution, you need to also know that when the value of your mean increases, if your value of your mean increases or decreases, it will shift your graph from left to right. So your graph will just move, oh, not like that, it's not, not with the point, it will just move from left to right. If it will move from left to right, or some way it might move there, it will move from left to right. When you increase or decrease, the value of your mean. I know that I said the mean of a normal distribution is equal to zero. So this normal distribution will not have a mean of zero because it has shifted. It will have a mean somewhere there, a standardized mean. And why, why I'm saying this is later on we will learn how do we standardize all this information so that we can create a normal distribution curve. So the mean here won't be zero because zero is here. So let's say the mean here will be one for this standard deviation or for this normal distribution. And the mean here will be two. Uh, this will be uh, minus one and this one will be two because this side is minus. Because if this in the middle is zero, then that is a minus. Then when it comes to the standard deviation, Remember, we already spoke about this. I said the standard deviation either will be tall or short and it will be one standard deviation. So when you increase or decrease, it will spread your curve. So the bigger you, you will see if the distance is bigger. I'm not drawing it right, but you can see that the, the flatter the bigger the standard deviation, the flatter your curve will be. The smaller your standard deviation, the smaller your standard deviation, the taller your curve will be. So when you move, increase or decrease your standard deviation, your spread of your graph will grow taller or flatter. And that is in relation to the mean and the standard deviation. Now, how do we standardize the value? So we will be standardizing the value by using the Z score or Z standard normal distribution. We can also use the Z score to compare the values as well to see which one is better than the other. If you want for the better weight of it to see which uh, which module or subject perform better than the other is doing better than the other all the students are are doing better than the other because with normal standardized normal distribution z score it will tell us in terms of the unit how far apart are your values from your mean from your original from your from each other how far apart how far do your students score uh, differ within the group as well. So we use the Z where we take the observed unit minus the the population mean divided by the population standard deviation. And this is a normal distribution because then it is distributed with the mean of zero and the standard deviation of one. So I'm not saying then go there and put one and go there and put zero. No. You will be given the population mean and you will be given the standard deviation. And in the question, they will give you your X and then you will use your X to answer the question. Like, for example, if X is distributed normally with the mean of 100 and the standard deviation of 50, what is the Z value or the Z score of X is equals to 200? So we know what our population mean is, our standard deviation is, and our x is given in the question. 
We just substitute into the formula. We know that it's Z is equals to X minus the mean divided by the population standard deviation. Our X is 200 minus the mean of 100 divided by the standard deviation of 50. 200 minus 100 is 100 divided by 50. We get 2.02. That is how far apart your observations are from each other or from the mean. So we can say that the X of 200 is two standard deviation above the 100 range mean that we're given. And if we calculate another one, let's say we find that the Z of this was 1.5, we would say this one is much better because it's closer two is closer to one and is closer to the mean so the smaller your z value the better the outcome okay so we'll look at the z score but i just also wanted to um because I, I don't think we will have time to do to repeat the hypothesis testing because I think we started with hypothesis of two samples. We never went with one sample or something like that. So, but I wanted to revise this part because I think um, it's very useful to know this. So, if I need to find the probability, uh, remember anyway, yeah, we're talking about the Z score. This is just for the Z units converting them from the standard the units to a normal distribution yeah i'm talking in general when you do hypothesis testing you're going to calculate the test statistic which is the z score remember that you will calculate your z uh, of x uh, your mean minus the population mean divide by the standard deviation divide by the standard uh, divide by the square root of n. Well, remember that. That's what you use in that uh, test statistic. So I'm not using this. I'm using the normal distribution, which is the z-score that we did. But the logic is the same. So if the, we need to find the probability of the less than, you need to pay attention. If you need to find the probability of a less than, then you need to look at what the answer you got for the Z score. If your value for the Z score is negative, because we're looking for Z less than A, less than a value that you got, if that A is negative, then on your table you will go to the smaller portion. If A is positive, you will go to the larger portion. Why I'm saying that? So if the value of Z is negative, therefore it means we're looking for this red side, which is the smaller portion. So that is for that. If your answer of Z is positive, therefore it means we're looking for that value, which is in the larger portion. You need to pay attention to that. On your table, remember this will be your z-score that you would have calculated. So let's say it's minus, I'm going to use the value I see in front of me, minus 0, 0,66. And we are looking for, say we're looking for z less than minus 0, 0,66. So you just going to go, you ignore the negative because that negative tells me I'm going to my smaller portion. So you go to 0, 0,66, which is that, and you look there, that's mean to Z, larger to portion. And so that will be my probability. That is if Z is less than, if Z, oh, sorry. If Z was greater than 0, 0,66, then you will be going to the larger portion. Remember that. Let's look at this example. Let X present the time it takes in seconds to download an image file from the internet. 
Suppose x is normally distributed with the mean of 18 and the standard deviation of 5. Find the probability that your x is less than 18.6. So we go and calculate because we know that this is not normally distributed. We want to standardize this. We go and calculate our z value. What we given the mean, which is the population mean, and the standard deviation, which is the sigma. Our x is given in the question. The x, 18.6 minus the mean of 18, divide by 5. When we calculate this, we get 0, 0.182. Now I need to look at this. It said, if my answer is positive, I need to go to the larger portion. Now going to the table, because I have standardized my normal distribution to uh, my mean of 18 and standard deviation of the mean, I've standardized it to a normal distribution. Now I can go and find this probability. And finding this probability, you will go to the table. Okay, so yeah, I've copied another table, which is, so yours looks different to this. Um, so we're looking for z of 0, 0,12. So you go 0, 0,12. And we're looking for the larger portion. So you go to larger portion, which is that. So if I, let me see if I go back to your table, the way it looks, 0, 0,12. So we, we do have it. 0, 0,12 and the larger portion would be 0, 0,5478. And that's how you will find the probabilities. So that was for the less than. If it's greater than, you also need to look at the sign. If the value of your A is negative, you go to the larger portion. Okay. So if it's Neg sorry, if it's negative, you can see that for a larger z, we put the sign, the, the red shaded light on this side of greater than. So if it's negative, we know that you're looking for the larger portion for negative. If it's positive, we use the smaller portion. So let's look at an example. Now find x. Uh, the same probability, now we just change our sign to a greater than. So we know that when we calculated all this, we found that the probability was 0, 0,12. I'm not going to go back and calculate z of the mean again, because we did calculate that and we found that it was 0, 0,12. And that is the answer we got. So to get to the table, you go because it's positive, let's write, let's redraw that again. Because we're looking for the greater, so it means we're going to have our shaded side, this side. The answer is positive, therefore we're looking for the smaller portion. So we go to 0, 0,12 and we look at the smaller portion and that will be the answer that you are looking for. That is for the greater than. If it was negative, we will go to the larger portion. Now, the other thing you need to take into consideration is if they ask you for the between. If they say it lies between the two values, then you need to know that you need to take either the difference between the two values. So, If we need to find the probability that x lies between 18 and 18.6, we can go and calculate for 18. We find that our z value is 0, 0,00. If we go to the table, it will just be 0, I guess. And we need z of 18. We calculate it as well individually, and we get that it is 0, 0,12. So now we can go and find the probability. So, but we're going to be using mean to z. So when we use mean to z, you've got two options. 
you can either use the larger portion and subtract one from the other. So, yes, subtract one from the other. Or you can use mean to z. If you use mean to z, therefore you go to the probability of, oh, sorry, the z of zero and the z of 0, 0,12. You take both of them, add them together. And that will give you the same. So if you go to the larger side, you will have to take the, the bigger one minus the smaller one. But I will prefer that you use the mean to z because it's easier. You just go to the mean to z for the first one and mean to z for the second one. Take the mean to z values, add them together, and that will give you the probability of between. And that is in a nutshell how you use your tables, including also how do you find the normal distribution Z scores. So now let's look at examples of questions you get from your exam papers relating to only, okay, I must also clarify. Here we're only looking at the Z score the normal distribution, Z score, not the probability. I just wanted to show you the probability part of it. Okay, so I know that we had one question up there, but we can always get back to it once we're done with the other one. A standardized normal distribution has a mean of mm, and the standard deviation of mm, mm. Option one, option two, or option three? Sorry? Number one. It's number one. It has the mean of zero and the standard deviation of one. Study the following figure representing the distribution of a variable. The probability that specify the number drawn purely at random from a variable distributed like this is would fall in the gray area. Oh, then here we can use also what we just learned now. They say it would fall in the gray area, which this would have been the gray area. That would be equals to greater greater than so greater than x is equals to 155 choose the answer closest to the correct one from the points so yeah they're asking you actually to find the probability what is the probability which is what what we we just said so pay attention we're looking for greater than so yeah we say probability of x greater than 155. We're looking for that. So since it's greater than, remember if it is positive, we go to the smaller side of the table. If it's negative, we go to the larger portion. You always need to remember that. So now we need to go calculate x is equals to the mean divided by the standard deviation. And I think for your subject, they use the x bar, which is the same. So we can use x bar here instead of the population mean. We can use your sample mean and your standard deviation, which is s mean one and the same because this is your sample standard deviation. So your observation is 155 minus your mean of 150 divided by your standard deviation is 5. Calculate and tell me what the answer is. Answer is one. Answer is one. So we need to go to the table. Do you have your tables up? 
you can open one of the past exam papers. Um, yes. Do you have do you have them up? If you scroll right at the back of your exam paper, there is a table called mean standard normal distribution table. And Okay. Let me open let me open it for those who don't have the paper in front of them. Let me stop sharing and share my entire screen. So you have this table. Can you see it? Let me see if I can open a better one. Okay, this is a better one. This is the this is it. Okay, so this the first part. Don't get confused. This is zero comma zero zero. This is zero. This is zero comma zero one. This is zero comma zero two. Because when I you can't scroll, see anything, I can't see anything. You can't see. I'm gonna the stop screen is and, blank. and share again. And now. Nothing, just a blank screen. Others? See. I can see. Yes, I can see. I can see as well. Yes, you can. I can see. I can see you. Okay, so those who can see, log out and log in quick, quickly. I can Go see it now. I can see it now, Miss Boy. Thanks. Okay. All right. So what I'm saying is all these Z scores here on your table, these are 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0,001. So if you're looking for one, this is not one. And this is not 10, it's 0, 10. So you need to go to the bottom and there is your one. So we're looking for the smaller portion. So when we look for the smaller portion, we go to that value there, which is 0, 0,15887. So if I go back to the presentation, zero comma. Uh, what did we get? Zero comma. One five eight seven. One five eight seven. 0, 0,1587. Now round it off to two decimal. 0, 0,16. 0, 0,16. Okay. Okay. And that's how you will find your answers. Mm, sorry, Miss Boy, to mm. disturb you, but this is also on page 165 on our study guide. Okay. So you can go find the table on page. 165 on your study guide. Appendix D. Okay. okay for the video. <laughs> Okay, let's go on. Joseph scores 60% in a history test. The class mean now, the class mean and the standard deviations are 10. So here is one part for history test. 50% in a biology test and they also give you the mean and the standard deviation. Use the Z score to decide which statement is true relative to the rest of this class. John does. So we need to calculate for history. And we need to calculate for biology. What we are given like normal. What is our X? What is our mean? And what is our standard deviation? Let me not even go there. 
let me not write it here. We can write it there. So here we can write the formula. We know that we will calculate Z of X, the mean of the standard deviation, and we do the same. You will need to calculate that. So he, he scores 60%. You can either change this to a decimal because it's 60% or you can use the 60%. So this is your X. This is the mean. This is the standard deviation for biology. Let's start with there. So if I convert this to decimal, 60% is 0 0,6. You can also use it as 60%. There is nothing wrong. You can say 60% on your formulas. Uh, and when you calculate, it will still give you exactly the same thing as when you convert it to a decimal. And the mean is 65, which is minus 0 0,65 divided by the standard deviation of 0 0,10. Calculate that. 60 minus 65 divided by 10. What do you get? History is 0 0.5. And Wait, I... don't do biology because we haven't oh. got to there. <laughs> Sorry, history. 0 0.5. Is it, it is 5. It cannot be 0 0.5. It has it's to be minus, minus, minus 0 0.5. Minus, minus 0 0.5. 0 0.5. 0 .5. Okay, and then we need to do for biology. Biology, he scores, this was our X, our mean is 53 and our standard deviation is 12. So we substitute 0 0.5 minus 0 0.53 divide by 0.12 minus 0 0.25 negative 0 0.25 minus 0 0.25 so now you need to check The answers, they say, number one, he did better in biology than in history. Number two, they are saying he did better in history than in biology. Number three, they say he did equally well in history and in biology. I will go with number one. Number two. You, uh, number two. Number two. So if let's say this is one or zero, let's put it zero there. This will be minus. 0 0.25 and this will be minus 5 there. So if this is the mean of the class, if it's the mean, if your Z score is 0 there, so therefore this is closer to there, therefore it means there is no difference in terms of performance between the class and Joseph. Because the other thing you can do also to check the prob is the probability. You can go and find the probability of each one of them. If we use the probability of more than or less than or less than, we can check whether you did which one says the probability is more than the other. 
and you can check on this one as well. So if, for example, you're not sure about your answer, let's see. Can any one of them, which one is okay? We have 0 0.25 and 0 0.5. 0 0.25, uh, this is smaller. Let's go to the smaller. It's 0 0.40, 0 0.5. On this side, 0 0.5 smaller is that. So that is 40% and that is 31%. So going back, which one relative to his? class did he do better in biology than in history or did he do better in history than in biology it's one better in biology he did better in biology than in history no it cannot be one because this we say below. Uh, if we use below, then it means he performed 40% below the class there. And this says he performed 30% below the class. So he did better in history. Where is it? Better in history than in biology. That is that one. That's number two. The area under the care okay, is can I just ask a question? Yes. On the previous, yeah. Um, if you just look at the the mean of the class for history, there's five percent difference between the two, and then with the biology test, there's three percent difference between what he got and what the class mean is. Yes. So that would be that there was a 5% difference in the history no. and a 3% in bio, which means that the no. history would be better. No. Remember, you're not only looking at the difference between the means. If it was like that, straightforward, then we would have said he did better in, uh, in biology because the mean of biology is closer to the mean of the, the class. Ne? Okay. But we also need to take into consideration the standard deviation because the standard deviation tells you how far apart everybody in that group was. So in biology, there is a 12% standard deviation, or which means 12% far away from the mean for each one of them from the class uh, on average all everybody their mean was 12 standard deviation away from the mean whereas in history the difference is 10 percent okay cool thanks and when you look at the probability as well remember he did 40 percent below average than the rest of the class. Remember, we're looking at 
relate, relative to the rest of the class. So he actually did better in history because it's 30% better below the average class. The area under the standard deviation curve equals its mean, its standard deviation, O0, O1. The area under the standard normal curve equals number three. Number three, it's equals to one. Mm -hmm. Joseph received 45 marks for psychology test. The average mark for his test is 35. And the standard deviation is 10. What is Joseph's score? So you need to calculate Z. We will get X minus the mean divided by the standard deviation. Mm -hmm. One, I get one. So the answer. Number one. How do we Number calculate? one. How do we calculate? What is our X? It's 45. And our, our mean? Is 35. And our standard deviation is 10. Is 10. Yeah. So then we say? 45 minus 10 minus 35 divided by 10. And that will be 10 divided, 10, by, 10. 10 divided by 10. And that is 1. John scored 15 in English. The class mean is 12. The standard deviation is 3. And 18 in geography. The mean is 13 and the standard deviation is 5. Use the Z score to decide which statement is true relative to the rest of the, his class. John does mm, better in English than geography, equally well in English and geography, better in geography than in English. So you need to go and calculate the z-score for John English and for geography. The answer is two. For English, what is our X? It's 15. Our mean is 12. And standard, standard deviation is three. It's three. And Oh. And the answer is? 3 divided by 3, which is 1. And in geography, what is our x? 18. And the mean? 13. And our standard Divided by 5. And that is? 5 divided by 5, which is 1. And the answer is number two. Because it does well both ways. The, the Z is equal to one. So why did you learn it? Look at the number of us. And that concludes today's session. But since we have 10 more minutes, I just want to go on to one of the exam papers. 
uh, all this, I send you the link. This all exam papers I downloaded from from there. Um, let's open one, which is any one of them. Mm -hmm. Okay. Question twenty three. Select the correct notation for the option below for the statement. The probability value is larger than one and a half. What will be the notation that you use? What is one and a half to start with? Um, that's half. Yeah, so we're looking for decimal. What is one and a half? 0 0.5. 0 0.5. So if that is 0 0.5, it should be clearer which one they are talking about in this instance. But three. a larger will mean greater than. Ne? So therefore it means is number three because then that is incorrect and that is incorrect. I think this we did, did we? The, in the population there are 450 people, 150 do not smoke. What is the probability of selecting a smoker? We did that. We did that because it was 300. No, yes, it was 300 divided by 450. We did mm. do this as one of the exercises. OK, this is one of those things that we didn't do. It talks to the central limit. Uh, but when we do the exam preparation, we'll go into detail on those ones. So let's look for the questions that we did. Here is one. A class of 10 boys and 11 girls includes Mary and her friend Elizabeth. Not me. Huh? <clears throat> First time that they don't use John or J Joseph. Chooses a class representative by writing the names of everybody in the class on a slip of a paper, putting those in a box and asking their teacher to draw one name blindly. <clears throat> so there are 11 and 10, 11 girls and 10 boys. What is the probability that Mary will be selected? So it means, what is the probability that one girl will be selected? Number three. It will be one over 10 plus 11 because they make 10 plus 11 makes up your sample space. So that will be one over 21, which is number three what is the probability that either mary or elizabeth will be selected number one now here is the thing <clears throat> So, because Mary and Elizabeth cannot happen at the same time, then they, it means they will be mutually exclusive. And because this is Mary or Elizabeth, <clears throat> therefore we use the probability of Mary or Elizabeth. Remember that was the probability of Mary plus the probability of Elizabeth. And since the probability of a simple event is 1 over 20, uh, 1 over 11, damn it, there are not 11, there are how many? 21. Plus one over twenty one. 
So we need to apply a little bit of meds because the probability are mutually exclusive. Therefore, the probability of Mary and Elizabeth will be zero. They cannot happen at the same time because they are both girls. <coughs> so doing a little bit of meds, some, some, uh, we're doing addition. They have common denominator. So our common denominator is one. We just add one plus one, and that will be two over 21. <clears throat> A college student claims that he can identify types of cheese by taste, an experiment is set up to test his ability. He is blindfolded and given three pieces of cheese and each representing a type. What is the probability that he will incorrectly identify one piece of a cheese? There is one out of number three. three. I think number three. Number three. So that will be number three. Suppose a height military recruit is normally distributed with the mean of 1,750 and the standard deviation of 50 drawing a sample of 25 each. We expect the standard deviation of the mean samples to be about. Okay, so uh, we didn't do this because this talks to the sampling distribution of the means. <sighs> Uh, we're not going to do this one now because I don't want to introduce you to a new concept that we didn't cover. We'll do this when we do the exam prep. Let's move to the ones that we did cover. A normal distributions are mm and mm. Three, two. Three two. Spell so I hear three two. So spell oh, shape okay. and the system. Hmm? One or two. Three or three or two. Um. Okay. Those who said three, do you still stick with your three? What have yes. I said? about the standard deviation. I repeated it so many times, I even forgot now. It's between okay. zero and one. It's, yeah, but um, we know that the mean is between, uh, the mean is zero and the standard deviation of one. That is the normal distribution. But I also said you can have a normal distribution For the mean, so this, all of them are normal distribution, but they have different means. Do you understand? So this one might have a mean of 100 there, this one might have a mean of 200, and this one might have the mean of, of 12. Similar happens with the standard deviation. Now I cannot clear the space. I'll have to delete the whole thing. With a standard deviation, I said one can have a standard deviation, the, the, the different standard deviation, because if this is your mean, the standard deviation for this one is there, the standard deviation is there, 
So if this one standard deviation is 0 0.5, this one is 1, and this one can be 1.3. Different standard deviations, even though they are barely kept. So here it says they have the same standard deviation. So then the answer correct. must be 1. Pardon? So the answer must be 1. The answer is number two. It's symmetrical with the mean of zero. Okay. Number two is incorrect. This is a. Okay, that one. That one we did. Okay, during the interpretation of a psychological measurement, the normal distribution is, uh, is this relating to something else? Nope. Yeah, they just want you to tell them what normal distribution is. Is it an adapted to fit the observed frequencies of scores? Is it used as a theoretical model for interpreting the observed distribution of scores? Or three is used to calculate the relative frequency of the observed scores? And that should be number three. We did this one. That one we did. And I think time's up. Um, so I will let you know when we're going to have our exam preparation. Uh, probably. I'll have to negotiate the time for next week. And because you're writing on the 10th, so we can uh, we can chat on WhatsApp. If you are available on Friday and Saturday, we can do the two sessions, one on a Friday and one on a Saturday. Um, because next week's session on the 7th is supposed to be the stats session, but I can negotiate that with the stats 1502. Then we can have a session again there because then I will have them for the rest of the month every day. Mm -hmm. But I will communicate that because then uh, the 7th is another group uh, session for another class. So I need to negotiate that with them first. Otherwise, is there any question or comment or input? If there are none, then we are done for the day. Just to recap what we've done. There was a hand up. Oh, I can't see the hands up. Um, let me stop sharing. I can go to the chat as well. Yes, you can know know my timbre. Yes, good evening, ma'am. How are you? I'm fine, thanks. And how are you? I'm good. Um, I just want to say thank you so much. Um, I was scared. I thought I was even thinking of postponing this module to write it next year. But um, it's getting better and better every day, oh. every time after I attend the session. However, I just still have a little problem. Maybe next time, just to assist me to download the calculator, that calculator, the one that you, you showed us the last time, the last session. Okay. On your, mm -hmm. on your phone? Yes, ma'am, because I'm using a phone most of the times. We don't have electricity, so we use, I'm using a phone. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so uh, much. You can really contact me. 
you can contact me on WhatsApp, then I can help you. Okay, ma'am. All right. Thank you so much. I've posted the, the, the register again on the link on the chat. Please make sure that you complete the register before you leave. Any other question or comment? If they are none, then enjoy the rest of your, your evening. We'll chat further on WhatsApp. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. I'm looking for the register. Where is it register? Uh, I will also post it on the on the WhatsApp if anybody can find it on the chat. Okay. <laughs>